Dieter Helsum entered the dark hall and watched the high figure that was on the other side of the room, turning his back to him. At the man's feet an extraordinary black panther lay languidly, raising his head to observe the just-arrived individual. Its owner, however, did not move at all. Welcome, number thirty and seven. How has your trip gone? As each time it listened to that voice, Dieter remained frozen, and unconsciously he began to look at the ground. Somehow it was impossible for him to maintain his gaze on the man in black, even when looking at his back. Very well, sir. Everything has happened as you predicted. I have left the apparatus where you asked, and in my report you will be able to see that he did not finish his sentence. Before he could continue, his interlocutor made a gesture of disdain with its hand to indicate he should shut up. I was not referring to that. I did not have any doubts that it would turn out well. What I was asking is if you have enjoyed your first trip on the Zeppelin. Yes, sir, it has been interesting. As always, Helsum asked himself what was in the mind of that person, and inevitably began to feel more and more nervous. Neither the Principality of Gabriel nor the Empire knew anything about his master, and even somebody like the Lord of Nightmares, Malekith, was more than a marionette in attaining objectives that Dieter did not even begin to glimpse. I am very glad that indecipherable voice continued. Now, we can proceed to the second phase of the preparations. Surely it is going to be very interesting to observe what is going to happen. The panther rose from the ground and it began to rub against his legs, while he, distractedly, admonished it with some taps as if it was nothing more than a small sweet cat. Then, slowly, the man in black turned around and began to walk towards the exit of the room. Dieter remained in the same position, with his head down. But the, while the figure passed by his side, he could not avoid looking into his eyes for a moment. And he felt cold. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildred, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. So, it's been a while, hasn't it? I tried to maintain a two-week schedule, but then a lot of things happened along the way, the least of which being some new employment and the worst case of writer's block I've had in recent years. But moreover, to my shame, I got bit by the procrastination bug. I make no apologies for it, and it's entirely my fault. But hey, it's a new year. The winter's gone, and some of you have likely learned not to drink that eggnog. Perfect time to roll some dice again, isn't it? So, let's talk about Anima. No, not that one. I already reviewed that. No, not that one either. Besides, I don't even review manga. I review games. Smartass. Anima Beyond Fantasy. In short, a Spanish RPG inspired by Japanese video games published by a Minnesota company and now being reviewed by a gaming monk. And if you listen close, you can hear the exploding head of a Mary Sue writer because she doesn't know who to accuse of cultural appropriation first. This is going to be a different review from my previous ones because I'm covering the entire line of the Anima RPG series, not merely the core book. The analysis will be segmented among the four pillars of the game, the core mechanics, key, magic, and psionics. As such, the character creation and mechanics sections will be a bit longer than normal due to the sheer weight of material covered. So let's begin. Motif aside, Anima takes place in a gestalt fantasy type of setting called Gaia. The crux of the conflicts are centered on the civil war between the long-standing Abel Empire and the seceding Azure Alliance. Now before anyone starts yelling Star Wars, the game's history section goes out of its way to show that neither side is wholly good. Much of it is shades of grey. Beyond those powers, you have various nations that are independent from the Empire and the Alliance, most of them in the new continent to the west. You have the slow return of more and more supernatural phenomena, perplexing several factions within Gaia. And obviously, this is a gross simplification. There are many natural and supernatural factions within Gaia, and I may cover them in further detail at some point. Perhaps in a... lore video. I'll keep that in mind for later. Simply speaking, Anima's artwork is gorgeous. Most of the artwork is done by Wen Yu Li, and it contributes strongly to the game's visual identity. And that identity is carried over into some of his other projects like Luminous Echo, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Moreover, the game's style doesn't interfere with the readability of the book. While it could use a few summary points at the end, I don't have a hard time finding anything within the books. I do have one significant nitpick, though. The core rulebook doesn't have an index. The X-Set expansions do, but the core book I have doesn't have one. 
I realize this is coming off like a broken record at this point, but I'm going to keep calling it out when I see it. If you've got a core rulebook of any notable size, or any rulebook of any notable size, put in a damn index. It's going to save your players a lot of headaches. And your GM, too. Character creation is by far the crunchiest part of the game, if only because of the sheer variety of things you can do with the right build. To reflect this, we'll be making four characters. One basic character and one utilizing the three main systems, Key, Magic, and Psionic. I should note, however, that even in the core book, there's still a great deal of variation between those systems, but I have to keep it to these three, otherwise we're going to be here for days. Throughout the four examples, the steps to create a character are the same 12-step setup shown here. As our starting example, we'll use a non-supernatural scout named Gavion. For step one, we'll be using method four, which instills rolling 8d10 and distributing the result freely between the eight characteristics. Agility, Constitution, Dexterity, Strength, Intelligence, Perception, Power, and Willpower. Bearing in mind that no characteristic can reach past 10, this method gives us 63 points to spend. With that, our total is Agility 10, Constitution 9, Dexterity 10, Strength 6, Intelligence 7, Perception 7, Power 6, and Willpower 8. Step 2 is Race. In an Anima, human is considered the default race, with non-human races usually falling under the umbrella of the Lost Souls, also known as Nephilim. Nephilim are essentially the souls of supernatural beings reincarnated in human bodies. This grants its own benefits, but also a penalty to experience gained. In Gavilon's case, he's a simple human instead of one of the Lost Souls. For Step 3, we pick our class. Now, Anima has 20 classes, but it's more apropos to call them archetypes in terms of how they're implemented. This is because classes are less about what you can do granted by the class and more about how easily you can learn and develop certain abilities. Since Gavilon is working on a scout theme, he'll be going with the Ranger class. This gives him a life point multiple of 20. In addition, the Ranger class determines how easy or not it is to spend development points, which we'll get to later. Step 4 is Advantages and Disadvantages, which are innate modifiers that allow access to supernatural abilities or modify abilities that you already have. These can only be gained through character creation and can be bought off in GM-approved circumstances. Gavilon starts with three creation points and may gain no more than five points from buying disadvantages. In this case, he purchases the bad luck disadvantage, giving him four creation points to spend. One of these will go into acute senses and three points into quick reflexes. In step five, we use the development points that we start with to buy primary abilities or improve on them. Development points are the way that you get better. And the rate of increase depends on class, as I mentioned before. Every character starts out with 600 points to spend on primary and or secondary abilities. Now given that, we'll put 100 in attack, 100 in dodge, 100 in life point multiples, 80 in acrobatics, 30 in notice, 20 in search, 30 in trap lore, 60 in stealth, and 80 in the following modules. Area attack, increased critical, and multiple missiles. In step 7, we add the innate ability bonus given by the class. This is a modifier to abilities that one gets each level without spending DP. As a ranger, he gets the following abilities. Plus 10 to life points, plus 5 to initiative, plus 20 martial knowledge, plus 5 attack, plus 10 notice, plus 10 search, plus 10 track, plus 5 trap lore, plus 5 animals, and plus 5 herbal lore. In step 8, you add your innate bonus to a secondary ability. After spending the DP that we did before, you can choose one secondary ability and add your characteristic modifier a second time. In Gavilon's case, we'll choose Stealth. Since that skill is based on agility, he gains a plus 15 bonus to his Stealth skill. For Step 9, we determine derived characteristics like Life Points and Initiative. A character's base Life Points is based on their Constitution score, while their Initiative score is rooted in 20 alongside Dexterity and Agility modifiers, though an equipped weapon may change this. Gavilon's constitution is 9, which gives him a base LP of 120. Since he bought 5 life point multiples, for a total of 6, each multiple increases his LP by his constitution score. Thus, along with his class bonus of 10, that makes his total life points to be 184. As for initiative, his agility and dexterity modifiers are 15 each. Because he spent 3 creation points on quick reflexes, this gives him 60 to his initiative. Putting all these together, he has a base initiative of 135. Gavilon is armed with a short bow, which changes his base 20 initiative to minus 10, making his initiative with his short bow to be 105. In step 10, we continue the derived 
attribute calculation by calculating the character's resistances. Now every character is going to have five resistances, each based on your base presence of 30 and modified by different characteristics. The five types are disease, magic, physical, poison, and psychic. Taking his modifiers into account, he has the following resistances. Physical 40, disease 40, poison 40, magic 35, and psychic 40. Step 11 is supernatural abilities, but because Gavilan doesn't have any supernatural abilities per se, we'll be skipping this step for now. The final step is startup funds and starting equipment. Your starting funds are based on your social class, and to determine that class you roll a d10 and consult the appropriate range. In this case we rolled a 9, putting us in upper class, which starts us with 20 GC. We'll be spending that on a short bow, 50 standard arrows, 20 armor piercing arrows, a leather coat, pants, a vest, four weeks of rations, an arrow quiver, 30 feet of good rope, and four small traps, leaving us with 33 silver as effectively pocket money. Non-supernatural character creation is pretty solid, and I can certainly see a lot of options that can be utilized. However, it does kind of feel that there might be a little bit missing. This will vary based on build, but one thing I can say is that the core book is very, very lacking when it comes to the combat modules. Most of them are proficiency based, and there's very few in the core book alone that can help expand the range of options. Bottom line, this is a game that very much is rewarding the gish type characters when it comes to character creation. It doesn't want people to fall into archetypes as strictly as you might get with other fantasy games. Key is the most combat focused of the subsystems, described as utilizing the natural energies of the body and environment to perform extra-human and supernatural feats. That said, I present our technician example as created by Xanatrix, the Exemplar. So, first I came up with an idea in my head of what type of key character I'd want to work with. Once I had that general idea, I started with step one in the character creation process, which is rolling your characteristics. There are multiple methods that can be used, however, I'm using the first method. As described in the books, you roll 1d10, eight times, and you ignore any results of one, two, or three. Then, with the lowest score in the lineup, you replace that with a nine. Leads to slightly higher power balanced characters, but that's due to the fact that this is a game about somebody being more than just a normal person. What I initially rolled was seven, seven, five, eight, ten, nine, nine and ten since five is the lowest score i replace it with a nine getting a final lineup of seven seven nine eight ten nine nine ten i choose to distribute the points with a seven in intelligence a ten in willpower a seven in perception a ten in power a strength in eight dexterity of nine agility of nine and constitution of nine because both my agility and constitution are 9, my movement value and fatigue values are 9. To calculate my appearance, I roll another 1d10, which results in 7. To calculate my size statistic, I add my strength and constitution together. Since my strength is 8 and my constitution is 9, that's a 17. Looking at a table provided in the book, this allows me to choose a height between 5 foot 8 and 6 foot 10, and a weight between 175 pounds and 530 pounds. I choose to make my uh, key technician a lightning bruiser type build with a linkier build of 6 foot 3 and 220 pounds. The next step in the character creation process, step 2, is choosing your race. Now, there are a few lost souls you can choose from. They are pretty powerful in their own right, but they come with their own disadvantages. They each have some pretty game-breaking advantages, though. Some of them looked really broken. But instead of choosing one of those lost souls and having to accommodate for those advantages and disadvantages, I decided to stay human. For step three, you choose the class you're going to play. Now, I already know I'm going to play some sort of key character. And since it's going to be a key-based character, I have to look into the Domine archetype of the core rulebook. In doing so, I choose the Technician class. This gives me a life point multiple of 20, plus five life points per level, plus five initiative per level, plus 15 martial knowledge per level, and a plus one innate psychic uh, point per level. It limits me to spending 60% of my total development points in primary abilities, and gives me a key accumula accumulation multiple 
of 10. Raising attack, block, dodge, and wear armor costs 2 development points per rank, and raising key costs 1 per rank. Uh, since this character will not be using any magic or psychic powers, the modifiers for those types of abilities have been left out for the sake of brevity. We move on to step 4, the advantages and disadvantages that you can choose at character building. You're given 3 creation points to start with. In doing so, I choose to take one level of key recovery, which allows me to cover one key point every 10 minutes instead of one key point every hour. And I take two levels of martial mastery, which give me 80 extra martial knowledge. Looking at all the common disadvantages I could choose from to gain other creation points to buy more advantages, I don't do that, even though there are other advantages I might like to take because none of the common disadvantages were really worth it. We move on to step five, using development points to buy primary abilities for the character. Since I'm not making a psychic or magic character, I will be spending them all on combat abilities. Now, I start with 600 development points, and as previously stated, my class only allows me to spend up to 60% of my total development points on primary abilities. In addition to this limitation, all characters can only spend up to 50% of their total points in offensive or defensive skills. This means that while I can spend 360 development points in all primary abilities, I can only spend a total of 300 in attack, dodge, or block. Again, since I'm choosing a lightning bruiser, I choose to spend 80 points each on attack and dodge. They cost 2 development points per rank. This gives me 40 extra ranks to each ability. I then add my characteristic modifiers to each score. Since attack uses my dexterity modifier of plus 10, I add that on, making it a 50, and dodge uses my agility modifier of plus 10, also making it 50. This leaves me with 200 development points I can use to buy martial arts, weapons, modules, and ranks in key abilities or, and accumulation. I decide to forego learning a weapon and remain unarmed. Due to this, I can learn martial arts at 25 development points each instead of the normal 50. Additionally, since I spent a total of 160 points in attack and defense abilities, I can learn a martial art for each of the 40 points I spent, meaning I can learn a total of 4 martial arts at this time. I decide only to buy Tai Chi and Kempo, which uses a total of 50 development points. This leaves me with 150 points I can spend in my key abilities and accumulation. My key points are equal to the characteristic scores of the associated characteristic. Thus, with 8 strength, I have 8 key pool, with 9 dexterity, 9 key pool, 9 agility key, 9 constitution key, 10 willpower key, and 10 power key. I choose to use 65 development points to raise all of the key pools to 20, just to have that leeway. My key accumulation for each of those stats is one key point in strength, one in dexterity, one in agility, one in constitution, two in willpower, and two in power. I use another 40 development points to raise the accumulation for strength, dexterity, agility, and constitution to tool. This leaves me with 285 development points for secondary abilities. In the sixth step, we use these remaining development points to buy secondary abilities. Uh, again, with the idea of a lightning bruiser, I'm going to choose a lot of stealthy and speedy type abilities. So I spend 60 development points each into athleticism, notice, search, and stealth, and I spend the very last 45 points into acrobatics. All of these skills cost two development points per rank under my class, so I divide all the amounts by two, rounding down giving me 30 ranks each in athleticism, notice, search, and stealth, and giving me 22 in acrobatics. Then I have to add all the characteristic modifiers for each ability. Acrobatics, athleticism, and stealth all use plus 10 from my agility, so they become acrobatics 32, athleticism 40, and stealth 40. Notice and search use my bonus from perception, which is plus 5, so they are both 35. Step 7 is pretty simple. You have an innate ability bonus, and since my class has a plus five innate ability bonus to attack, I add five more to my attack statistic, making that 55 attack and 50 dodge. Step eight is just as simple. It's adding your natural bonus to a secondary ability. Now a natural bonus just basically adds the characteristic modifier to an ability that it 
it doesn't already have. Essentially, if you wanted to add the characteristic modifier to an ability you already have, it'll add it again, because it already gets it once. So, I choose to add my natural bonus to stealth, which adds another 10 from agility to the score, resulting in 50 stealth. Step 9 is calculating things like your life points and initiative. In order to calculate life points, you take the base life points of 20, and then I add 10 times my constitution score. My constitution score being 9, I add 90 to that 20, giving me 110. On top of that, I add my constitution modifier, which is plus 10, for a total of 120 life points. Then, finally, the five, plus 5 from my class for 125. To calculate my initiative, I first start with my base initiative of 20 and add my agility and dexterity modifiers to the base. Both agility and dexterity have a plus 10 modifier, so I have 40 initiative. Again, adding my class bonus of plus 5, I end with a total initiative of 45. Step 10 is calculating the resistances your character has. Each resistance uh, is associated with a different ability. Now at level 1, my character has 30 presence. In order to calculate each resistance, I add the characteristic modifier to my presence for each different type. Now there are three firmly physically based resistances, one of them actually called physical resistance, that are all based in constitution. There's one magic resistance stat and one psychic resistance stat, both based in different characteristics. For my disease resistance, it's a constitution based resistance. I take my presence of 30, I add my plus 10 modifier from the characteristic constitution, and I end up with 40 disease resistance. For my magic resistance, I have to use the characteristic power. Now my power characteristic has a modifier of plus 15, so I get 30 from my presence, plus 15 from the power characteristic modifier to get 45 magic resistance. The next resistance calculated is physical resistance. It's another constitution-based resistance, so it has the plus 10 modifier from my constitution, plus my 30 presence, that's 40 physical resistance. Venom resistance is another constitution-based resistance, so again, 30 presence plus 10 from the constitution, 40 venom resistance. Finally, psychic resistance is based in the characteristic willpower. Now, willpower is also at a 10, so it has a modifier of plus 15. So that's 30 presence plus 15 equals 45 psychic resistance. In step 11, I'm getting to choose my key abilities. I use the martial knowledge I have to buy these key abilities. I started with 50 martial knowledge from the technician class, and I add the 80 from the martial mastery advantage level 2. This gives me a starting total of 130 martial knowledge. I also get 30 martial knowledge from Tai Chi and 10 martial knowledge from Kempo. But to learn Tai Chi, I must first use 40 martial knowledge in order to buy the key ability use of key, or I can't learn Tai Chi at all. I also use martial knowledge to buy key control at another 30 martial knowledge, and presence extrusion, which costs another 10 martial knowledge. I also choose to buy two of the example dominion techniques from the dragon tree. I buy both of the level 1 techniques, the scales for 20 martial knowledge, and the claws for 30 martial knowledge. I keep the remaining martial knowledge for buying later key abilities and dominion techniques. Finally, calculating my startup funds and starting equipment. To get my starting funds, I roll 1d10 to determine my social status and get 7, placing me in upper class and giving me a starting amount of 20 gold crowns. I choose only to buy some initial clothing, such as pants, a shirt, and a vest, for a total of 4 silver crowns, 2 weeks of good field rations, which is another 10 silver crowns, a backpack at 20 silver crowns, 60 feet of good rope at 50 silver crowns, a small tent for one gold crown, and a blanket for one silver crown. Kind of Spartan, but this guy seems a little monkish to me anyway, so that's what I'm going for. This leaves him with a total of 18 gold crowns and 15 silver crowns to use. In the end, the process for creating this character was a little more complicated and a bit longer than I had initially anticipated, and I would need a lot more time to look into custom Dominion techniques, because there are a lot of modifiers you can add and create some really interesting moves. However, for quickly throwing together a good key-based character, this was a simpler process than I had imagined. I mean, it's longer than I had anticipated for character creation in general, but 
for the key character itself, this was very simple. I think that magical characters and psychic characters might be a little more involved. Uh, the longest step for any key-based character, however, is going to be key abilities and techniques, uh, especially if you choose to create your own dominion techniques. Uh, the second longest step would probably be choosing how many development points to spend into the key pool and key accumulation stats, as you need a good balance between the combat abilities and your key. In the end, uh, I could probably throw together another one, look into creating dominion techniques and see how that would defect the uh, entire process. It would definitely make the key abilities step a lot longer, especially when you're trying to ba balance your martial knowledge since each modifier you add to whatever move you're making is going to make it cost more martial knowledge. It's also going to raise the level of what it is, which at level one, you can't use more than level one key techniques. So that could also pose an issue. Magic itself has multiple theories as to how it works, most of them involving the manipulation of the flow of souls that permeates the world. Exactly how this works is an inexact science in-game that the books go over several theories on the methodology, but none of them are considered THE theory. Further complicating matters is the various magical traditions on Gaia that are expanded on in the Arcana Exet expansion. For the exploration of a magic-based character, we'll be creating a warlock example, Andreas. Using method 2, we roll 2d10 8 times, taking the higher result for each pair of dice. So taking this approach, we get the following results. 10, 10, 9, 9, 8, 8, 7, 7. After assigning these to the characteristics, we end up with the following results for our base. Agility 9, Constitution 7, Dexterity 9, Strength 7, Intelligence 8, Perception 8, Power 10, Willpower 10. Appearance, once again, is a d10 roll, which in this case results in an 8. Size is generated by the sum of Strength and Constitution scores which results in a size of 14, and thus Andreas has a height of 5'6", and a weight of 190 pounds. To shake things up a bit, in this case, Andreas is one of the Lost Souls, specifically a Nephilim Sylvain. This grants the following benefits, plus 10 to Magic and Psychic Resistance, plus 20 to Disease Resistance, plus 5 to Physical and Poison Resistance, as well as grant the Quick Healing, Inclination to Light, Sense Light and Dark, and Limited Needs benefits. However, this also means that she suffers a minus 5 penalty to experience gained. Andreas' concept is based around a magic knight. Given that, the warlock class is the most ideal choice, which grants an innate plus 5 bonus to initiative, attack, block, and dodge, as well as 20 Xeon points. The maximum amount of points I can spend on any given primary ability is 300. Once again, you start with 3 creation points to spend on advantages, gaining more points through purchasing disadvantages. In Andreas's case, she must take the gift advantage in order to use magic, an advantage that costs two points. After that, we spend one point on natural knowledge in a path, in this case fire, and one point on superior magic recovery. One point is from the aura requirement disadvantage. As mentioned before, we have 600 development points that can be spent, with the development cap at 300 points due to the class. Given that, we'll put 80 points in attack and block, giving us a base of 40 in each. Instead of spending points in Magic Projection, we can take a shortcut by using the 75 points on the Magic Projection as an attack module. This allows us to use the base 50 points as Magic Projection for Offensive Magic. To improve our spellcasting speed, we'll spend 50 points on Magic Accumulation, making it 20. Finally, we'll be spending the remaining 15 points on improving Xeon and adding 75 points to our reserve of Xeon. After the amount spent on primary abilities, we now have 300 points left to spend on secondary. Well, we start by adding 100 points on 5 life point multiples, each adding 7 life points for a total of 35 more. With the remaining 200, we'll spend 50 each on Notice, Search, Magic Appraisal, and Occult, giving us a base of 25 in each of these skills. Since we went with Warlock, we gain the following innate bonuses. 10 life points, 20 Xeon points, 1 innate Psychic, which we won't use, and a plus 5 bonus in the following, Initiative, Attack, Blodge, and Magic Appraisal. The bonuses that apply to martial knowledge and psychic points will be ignored for the purposes of this character once again, since those paths aren't going to be pursued. After spending development points, we can choose one secondary ability and add the attribute bonus a second time. In Andreas's case, we'll add it to the magic appraisal skill, making its total 60. We'll calculate life points first. Since Andreas has a constitution of 7, that makes our base life points out to be 95. 
As mentioned before, being a Warlock grants 10 additional life points and additional 42 from the multiples we purchased with DP, thus giving us a total of 147 life points as the final value. Base initiative starts at 20, and adding in the modifiers from Agility and Dexterity, as well as any penalties from armor or weapons, Andreas's base initiative is 65. As before, resistances are based on the character's presence, which is always 30 at first level, which is modified by the constitution bonus for physical disease and poison resistance, power for magic resistance, and willpower for psychic resistance. Finally, any extra modifiers from race or advantages are applied as well. Taking these into account, Andreas's resistances are physical 40, disease 55, poison 40, magic 75, and psychic 65. Andreas has the gift, which grants her several magical attributes. Xeon, magic accumulation, and magic projection, which have already been generated when spending development points. Furthermore, your intelligence modifier determines your magic level, which is spent on either one of the individual paths or on individual spells. In Andreas's case, she has a magic level of 30, with 40 points already in the fire path due to the natural knowledge on a path advantage. So we'll be spending the 30 points in the earth path. This means that she can cast any fire spell that is level 40 or less, and any earth spell that is level 30 or less. Additionally, going along a path allows a magician to choose free access spells at certain levels. In this case, the path allows for 4 spells up to level 10, 4 at level 20, and 4 more at level 30, with 2 more at level 40. Looking through the index, we'll go with Create Fire, Cleanliness, Magic Detection, Static Message, Enchant, Repair, Climb, Inhumanity, Magic Shield, Magical Protection, Speed, Cause Fear, Magic Beam, and Eliminate Spells. Andreas will have 20 gold coins to start with, which we'll spend on the following. Some pants, a vest, a dress, a wineskin, 30 feet of good rope, a small bag, 4 weeks of rations, a broadsword, and a plus 5 armored long coat. This leaves us with 14 gold coins and 44 silver coins as pocket money. In terms of sheer bulk of options, Magic users have this in spades. It's overwhelming to the point that I didn't cover any of the path spells because there's just so many. In addition, I opted not to cover summoning in this example because that is another giant can of worms. That said, I don't think this game falls into the Linear Warriors Quadratic Wizards trope. It's very easy to burn through your Xeon stores in battle or otherwise. Much like with Key, it's a matter of having a balance between Xeon and Accumulation. Too much Xeon with a low accumulation, and you'll be able to cast a lot of spells very, very slowly. Whereas a high accumulation with low Xeon means you'll be able to cast spells quickly, but you'll burn yourself out just as quickly as well. Psionics, also called the Psychic Disciplines, are the mental sister to the spiritually focused magic. A psychic generates large amounts of energy called a matrix. This matrix does not draw from a supernatural source like magic or key, but created from sheer willpower to influence the environment around the user. For our exploration of the psychic disciplines, we'll be creating a psychic fighter, Corella. For characteristics, we'll be using method 4, rolling the sum of 7d10 and spending the total as points individually, no characteristic being above 10. After the roll, we have 68 points. Distributing the points arrives at the following scores. Agility 8. Constitution 10, Dexterity 10, Strength 8, Intelligence 7, Perception 9, Power 6, and Willpower 10. The D10 for the Appearance roll resulted in a 6. Adding in the Strength and Constitution creates a size of 18. However, I'll be holding off on picking height and weight for the time being. In this instance, Corella is a Gion Nephilim, which grants 2 points to size, making it a total of 20, as well as plus 1 to Fatigue, plus 1 to Physical Resistance, plus 1 strength, spiritual vision, minus 10 to magic resistance, and the plus 3 penalty to experience that all Nephilim have. With his size adjusted to 21, Korra's height and weight are 7 foot 0 and 320 pounds respectively. Of the classes available, the Warrior Mentalist is the most suitable, and it grants the following innate benefits. Plus 5 to attack, block, dodge, and initiative, 10 life points, and 1 innate psychic point. Using the three creation points, we'll spend two points on free access to any psychic discipline to allow her to use psychic abilities. With the remaining creation points, we gain two points from Unfortunate and one power at a time, and spend three points on psychic point recovery. As before, we have a cap of 300 points to spend on primary abilities. And given these restrictions, we'll spend 100 points to gain the psychic projection module, 
60 points each on attack and block, 75 points on psychic points, which leaves 5 points extra for secondary abilities. Including the leftover points from before, that leaves us with 305 points to spend on skills. It should be noted that intellectual skills cost 3 points per rank instead of 2 as a warrior mentalist. Given that, we'll spend 100 points on life point multiples, adding 5 more for a total of 6. With the remaining 200 points, we'll spend 40 on the following skills. Athleticism, Jump, Feats of Strength, Notice, and Intimidate, giving us a base 20 in each skill. Our highest modifier is Strength, thus adding the innate bonus to one of the Strength skills is ideal. Given that, we'll add it to Feats of Strength, totaling at 60. Concerning life points, Korra has a constitution of 10, making her base life points 135. 10 points are added from being a warrior mentalist, and the 6 total multiples add 60 life points. The springs are total up to 195. She has a plus 10 modifier from agility and dexterity, and plus 5 more from being a warrior mentalist. Adding these to the base of 20 for initiative, and 20 more from the unarmed modifier, her base initiative is 65. As a level 1 character, Korra has a base presence of 30. Adding in the modifiers from Constitution, Power, and Willpower, as well as being a Jayan and a 15 bonus to Physical Resistance and a minus 10 for Magic Resistance, Korra's resistances are Physical 60, Disease 45, Poison 45, Magic 25, and Psychic 45. Korra has 6 total Psychic points from Development Point Spending. We'll be spending 4 of those points on Permanent Effects and using the remaining points as free Psychic points. First, one point is spent on affinity with the Psychokinesis Discipline, which allows points to be spent on learning powers from that discipline, in this case Psychokinetic Shield. Finally, we'll spend two more points to acquire an innate slot, thus allowing us to maintain the Psychokinetic Shield power. As with the others, Korra starts with 20 GC. We'll be spending 15 GC on a battle axe, a leather coat, pants, a vest, walking boots, and three weeks of field rations. This leaves 3 GC and 78 SC as pocket money. Psionics could be considered simple, relatively speaking. However, it can be fairly miserly given the amount of buy-ins that you have to do. Your matrix powers aren't limited by a set resource, but it's instead dependent on how the dice gods like you or not. That said, it is the most straightforward of the classes because all it takes is just one die roll to determine effects, but it's not exactly what I would call easy. Anima uses a D100 system. However, it's not a roll-under system akin to Warhammer Fantasy. The D100 is instead used positively. To say, a D100 roll plus modifiers versus a difficulty number. A natural roll of 90 or higher is considered an open roll, which acts as an exploding dice. However, each degree is progressively more difficult, since the minimum result required for an open roll increases by 1 each time. Ergo, the second roll needs a 91 or higher, the third roll needs a 92, etc. On the other side of the coin, a natural 1, 2, or 3 is a fumble. Beyond automatically failing, when you fumble, you roll a d100 to determine the level of fumble. This can range from the attempt not working or creating a detrimental effect against you. When combat is factored into this, there's a few aspects to consider. First, initiative is re-rolled each round and can be modified by the choice of weapon and armor at that given turn. Attacking is a contested action versus an attack with either block or dodge. The difference between the two final values is then referenced on the combat table to determine the final damage percentage after comparing it with the level of that armor type. For example, a fighter with a total attack of 113, subtracting this from the defender's block of 61, results in a final of 42. While the attack hits, the next step is to consider the armor type of the defender. In this example, the armor type is 1 against this type of attack. On the combat table, the damage inflicted is 20%. Our fighter's damage with his weapon is 90, making the final damage 18. But if we flip the initial rolls, and make the attacker's roll 61 and the defender's 113, the negative end on the combat table, using the same armor type, allows the defender to make a counterattack with a plus 25 bonus to the attack roll. If an attack inflicts damage equal to half a target's life points, then the target suffers a critical. When this happens, the attacker rolls a d100 and adds it to the damage. The total value is treated as the difficulty for a physical resistance check the target must roll. If they fail it, they suffer a penalty equal to the difference, which slowly recovers each round. Beyond this, there's a myriad of penalties and minor mechanics such as breakage. Even before factoring in supernatural powers, combat is very intricate and crunchy. 
I'm not sure how consistent this crunchy is with the genre it's emulating, but we'll get to that later. The key system hinges on two items primarily, martial knowledge and key points. However, I would be remiss if I did not mention the martial arts system that Anima utilizes. Martial arts allows you to modify your unarmed attacks with extra damage or other effects. However, they're not used as separate attacks, with the implication that you're combining these styles into your own combined whole. More importantly, martial arts helps to cultivate martial knowledge, which can be spent on the tree of key abilities as well as techniques. Techniques are specialized attacks you can craft and spend key to utilize. Alternatively, you can use one of the presets made available. These techniques can often be equated to the myriad of special attacks seen in numerous anime and manga over the years. Utilizing them requires key points. Key points are divided between pools drawn from five characteristics. Strength, Agility, Dexterity, Constitution, Willpower, and Power. However, using these techniques is not fire and forget. This is where key accumulation comes in. Essentially the raising power levels, ki, eye, and similar concepts. Accumulation determines how quickly you can gather the energy needed to use the technique. Furthermore, Dominus Exit, the expansion book for key users, provided a shortcut to the summoning abilities that some magic users can access with Seals of Invocation, which uses their key to summon supernatural beings. There are two pillars to the magic system in Anima, spellcasting itself and summoning. Much like key, a magic user has to expend a resource in order to cast spells, in this case, Xeon. But also like key, spellcasting is not instant. Magic accumulation determines how quickly you can gather Xeon to cast your spells. Magic has a further monkey wrench in that matter with magic projection, which determines the control of your spells, as well as acting as your spell attack value. Learning spells is based on your magic level, which is spent on spells directly at a higher cost or on one of the 11 paths of magic, akin to spheres of magic in D&D. Depending on your choice of path, it may become more difficult to develop along other paths of magic. Furthermore, in Arcana Exet, the expansion book for mages and psychics, the notion of metamagic was added, which allows you to pay extra to modify the effects of the pool of spells that you have. Metamagic is not path-based, but instead based on a greater tree called the Arcana Sephira. However, it also costs magic levels in order to utilize. Summoning, the other pillar of magic, is treated as four specialized skills. Summon, Control, Bind, and Banish. Summon is self-explanatory. Control subjugates supernatural creatures. Bind traps creatures in objects or in living creatures. And Banish forces supernatural creatures out of the material world. The difficulty and Xeon cost of using these skills is dependent on the level of the creature, and failing this can have significant consequence, or in some cases cause things like reverse summoning. Summoning and binding have their own alternate uses as well. Invocation and Familiars Invocation can be compared to the more iconic summons seen in Final Fantasy and other works. Usually they require the summon to complete an action as part of forging a pact, after which they may be called upon by making a summoning check and spending the requisite Xeon. Familiars, on the other hand, aren't as complex. Firstly, it requires a bind check as if the target was two levels higher and ten times the cost in Xeon. Additionally, you must spend half the normal bind cost in Xeon every day to maintain the bond, but you may call on and utilize the familiar at any time. Additionally, the familiar levels with you, gaining 100 development points to increase its own parameters when you gain a level. On the other hand, when the familiar takes damage, you may feel that effect yourself. Psionics are the simplest when it comes to mechanical complexity, but they still have their own complexity of build. It's worth noting that psionics is based entirely on how well you roll. Its three main aspects are psychic potential, psychic projection, and psychic points. Psychic potential is similar to accumulation from key and magic, but instead of building up a resource, you roll to determine the strength of an effect. Psychic projection effectively works the same way as its magic counterpart, and finally, Psychic Points are comparable to a mix of Magic Level and Xeon. See, they can be used in permanent or temporary ways. Permanent allows you to access a new matrix, learn new powers, use a power innately at the cost of two points, or strengthen Psychic abilities. On the other hand, you can use them temporarily to improve your abilities or temporarily learn a power. Let me get the obvious part out of the way. There is an improved version called Core Exet released in Spain, 
but that was never officially translated before Fantasy Flight lost the license. As such, I will not cover it here, but rather in a separate piece I'll be doing down the line. While the translation was in development, Anima Studio credited Rollmaster as an influence. It shows. Granted, Anima isn't nearly as chart-heavy as Rollmaster was, but it's nevertheless very crunchy. There's a myriad of modifiers within combat and the various subsystems to account for, arguably to an excess. I have a hard time imagining someone running this game without using at least one calculator when it comes to the combat and initiative systems. But despite the depth and crunch in combat, the secondary abilities do not receive nearly the same attention. This is an unapologetically combat-focused game, with many larger-than-life abilities. And if you prefer a skill-based approach, Anima might not be for you. Furthermore, I feel like the unforgiving nature of the combat clashes a little bit with the Gestalt fantasy aesthetics it's going for. Many of the more detailed modifiers aren't really needed and your action pool is a little too limited for what it's trying to do. There's also the fact that you can be fairly overpowered in a scant few levels, but I think the level rewards could have done with a bit of spreading out. All that said, I feel like Anima is better as a toolkit than utilizing the Gaia setting exclusively, which is why I haven't really covered it here. At its core, Anima is a rough diamond. It has strong flaws, but it also has a great many strengths and embraces what it wants to be with earnest. I won't deny that it can be intimidating at first, but I hope I have demonstrated that it can be worked with once that initial hurdle is passed. All things considered, the highest grade I can give it is cautiously recommended. If you're more of a narrativist gamer, or one that prefers lighter degrees of crunch, this will likely not be for you. However, I can highly recommend it to those who love to tinker and toy with the mechanics and builds of a game. There's a lot, and I mean a lot, to customize in this particular toolbox, making an ideal choice for the mad scientist sort of gamer. Sadly, the English version is out of print, due to Fantasy Flight Games losing the license when they entered their partnership with Asmodee. While fans translations of some of the post-FFG works have been forthcoming, it's still a very, very rough work in progress. The silver lining is that the PDF versions are still being circulated through a simple Google search, if you do end up trying it, I'd recommend starting with the core book and the GM's toolkit. If you like what you see from that, only then would I recommend diving into the rest of it. But the final question is would I recommend it to manga fans who are getting into the hobby? Not entirely. But it ultimately depends on what genres they're familiar with. Either way, this is not going to be for everyone. It might not even be for you. But I think if you give it a chance and look past the intimidating size of the book, you might find something worth keeping.